Welcome to the Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church of Memphis Incorporated YouTube channel. And thank you so much for joining us today. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we need your help to recognize when our thoughts and intents are evil continually. When you show us our true selves, then we need you to bring forth a heart of admittance and change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get started for today. Our text for this week is found in Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. That's Genesis chapter 6, verse 5 through 6. And it reads, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he, it grieved him to his heart. And this week I want to talk about God hears our thoughts. Now there are many uh, uh, subjects that we could uh, use from this text, but uh, I landed on God hears our thoughts. Most of us never admittedly acknowledge uh, that our thoughts are continually evil, even if we're seeing ourselves according to God's view of us. When we fail to line up with God's word in the way we live and think, most likely our view of ourselves is not in sync with God's view of us. Men and women's actions at that time and in this day and age were very wicked, and their thoughts and affections were completely evil by this time. Now, we can jump over to the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 32. Uh, I'm not only going to read uh, about three verses of that, but you, I, I, I would uh, suggest that you read verses 18 through 32 of Romans chapter 1, and it deals with God's wrath on unrighteousness. So Romans chapter 1 verse 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodly and unrighteousness uh, of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are, un they are without excuse. That's the English Standard Version. Now, near the turn of the century, uh, a uh, man wrote a book, and his name was F.W. Farrell. Uh, he wrote a book entitled Seekers After God. The book was popular. It was a very popular seller and was cons in considerable demand. A certain Western bookseller had a number of re requests for the volume, but had no copies available. He sent a telegram uh, to the dealer in New York City requesting that they send him uh, a number of the books. And after a while, a telegram came back which read, no seekers after God in New York. Try Philadelphia. The results of the search for the book is much like the story of mankind throughout the ages. It's hard to find true seekers after God in most nations. 
God was sorry that he had made humankind because people generally did not want a relationship with God. That's true in this day and age. People do not want a personal relationship with God. They want God for everything but a personal relationship with. In order to have a personal relationship, you've got to, to, to accept Jesus, God's son, as your Lord and your Savior. And then the Holy Spirit will start bringing about that true relationship. Now, during that time, they insisted on living life independently of God. And that's true of now. And consequently, destroying themselves in sin. God was sorry over what his special creation had become. And, and this is a term that... Uh, uh, describe what Moses is doing. It's called anthropomorphism. Moses described the Lord as having human emotions. God was sorry that he had made the human race. God is not a robot. We know him as a personal living God, not a static principle who while having a divine purpose to be sure also engages intimately with his creation. Our God is very affected by and even pained by the sinner's rebellion. Acknowledging the possibility emotion-wise, of God does not diminish the inability or his in immutability, in immutability of his promissory purpose. It does, let me, I'll say that again. I got, my tongue got twisted. God, uh, acknowledging the possibility of God having emotions does not diminish his immutability of his promissory purpose, but rather his feelings and actions towards men, such as judgment and forgiveness, are always naturally consistent with his indispensable person and just and gracious resolve, as stated in James chapter 1 verse 17. And this is the, the, the message version. It reads, every desirable and beneficial gift comes out of heaven. The gift is a river of lighting, of light cascading down from the father of light. And there's nothing deceitful in God, nothing two-faced, nothing fickle. God doesn't wear a mask to disguise his true identity. And in this day and age, he doesn't have to wear a mask to protect him from uh, COVID-19 or the Delta variant. God is not two-faced. Now, you always know who you're talking to when you bow down on bended knees and have a little talk with the Lord. God is always who he is. He told Moses, I am that I am. He's whatever we need that is good. And yet he's the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. With the passing of the centuries came the degradation of the individual and the family that became that of the society. A true fact about a day, about today. Uh, an individual can degenerate the family. And that family can start intermingling in, 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 in society. 
and society will become degenerated. In the time of our text, there had been an intermixture between the descendants of Cain and those of Seth. There were strong-minded, godless men, ultimately, that were swept away by the flood. Now, God's description of their lives was a terrible one. The wickedness of man was great. That's God's description of them. The wickedness of man was great. That described the outward condition. And every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That describes the inward character. The completeness of the depravity is revealed in the use of the words every, only, and continually. God was defied and the flesh with its passion and lust was pregnant with destruction. And whenever mankind defies God, our lives, our very lives are pregnant with destruction. All of this God Jehovah saw. Then his decree went forth that his spirit should not always strive with man and the, the limits of 120 years was then set. In the midst of this degeneration, Noah is seen as a man walking with God. With this man, God holds communion and brings him into cooperation with himself for the preservation of a seed and the bearing of a testimony. We ought to always, be based upon our personal relationship with God, have a personal testimony. Those, the closing, the closing declaration, the closing declaration, thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so he did, is a remarkable revelation of Noah's faith. It was a period of strange experiences. And you walk out your day, that door in this day and age, you can e easily experience some strange experiences. Driving down the street, down the interstate, you can experience some strange things. It's kind of like uh, the past president uh, uh, inauguration. Uh, what was his name? Out of sight, out of mind. Trump. Uh, during the inauguration, uh, the president before Obama, George Bush, leaned over to somebody, and I can't say it the way he said it, but he, he said, this is some strange going ons. The godless were living, in, 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 and I might add, he didn't know the fullness of that statement until later on. Now the godless were living and flourishing in all things mental and materially. There is no doubt that for material gain, they cooperated even with Noah in the building of the ark, which they must have held in supreme scorn or disdain. But nevertheless, in every nail, and foot of the work completed, space was given to them to repent. And Noah preached righteousness by the very building of the ark. Righteousness 
that he obeyed God. He walked with God by faith and not by sight. Yet, it would seem as though none of those that cooperated with Noah profited except Noah and his family. And his carpenters were finally destroyed outside of the ark that they had helped to build. Let me leave you with uh, these nuggets. Proverbs 26 and 16. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 16 says, Dreamers, and this is uh, the message version, dreamers fantasize their self-importance. They think that they are smarter than a whole college faculty. And then Isaiah chapter 55 verse 7 says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. There was a man named Dr. Walter Calvert, a cavert. He reported a survey on worry and thoughts that indicated that only 8% of the things people think about or worry about were legitimate matters to be concerned about. If only 8% are things legitimate, they, they, they are legitimate matters of concern, then what about the other 92%? Listen to this. The other 92% were either imaginary, they never happened, or involved matters over which people had no control whatsoever. Just minds running away with folks. When our thoughts betray us in these types of thoughts, imagining spending time on things that never happen or things that we have no control over, then we are drifting into a category namely narcissism, which is selfishness, egotistical, self-absorbing, or vanity. It's an exaggerated sense of our own self-importance. Our thoughts can reach its most dangerous points when we try to exalt ourselves unintentionally or unmindfully, but willfully above God. When we try to exalt ourselves above God in our minds, we're standing on shaky ground. What if we had a president that displayed an exaggerated sense of his self-importance? At that point, right seems like wrong and wrong seems like right. We ourselves, when right starts to seem like wrong and wrong seem like right, we're standing on shaky ground. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse three through five says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 
For the weapon of our warfare is not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted it itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We therefore should use our God-given abilities to cast down imagination starting with our own. We should pray that the Holy Spirit will tear down every high thing within us that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Remember, God hears our thoughts. And remember, evil thoughts leads to evil actions if allowed to go unchecked. I'm out of time now. I got to leave you, but let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we need your help to recognize when our thoughts and intents are evil continually. When you show us our true selves, then we need you to bring forth hearts of admittance and change. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So until next time, remember, there's been a great price paid. to move us into reality. And that great price was paid one Friday on an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary. Jesus Christ died to pay for our sins, to reunite us back together with God. And now that our minds have been we have been set free from the penalty of sin now the holy spirit is working to set us free from the power of sin that's working in our minds even to separate us from god but grieve not the holy spirit but allow him to work wonders in your lives and he will until next time God, I believe, will continue to keep us, to lead us, and use us in his service. So long. Bye-bye.